This is Rob. Hello, Rob. It's Steve Julian from AngryMarks.com. Oh, hey, Steve. How's it going? How's everything right now in Kansas City? Oh, doing good, doing good. Just doing my normal scrambling around before I hit the road tomorrow morning. That's right. It is the road to WrestleMania, quite literally. You and I are both on that road because <laughs> I'm making a road trip to Dallas myself. Huh. Oh, good. Maybe we'll pass each other. Yeah, well, I'm sure we will at some point. I mean, you've got a crazy busy <laughs> schedule, so if I want to catch you, I probably need to know your schedule as opposed to vice versa. So let's start with that for this interview. What all are you doing WrestleMania weekend? Let's see. I uh, will be painting live at WrestleMania Access. Uh, I'll be right outside of the Superstore, so people don't even need you know an access ticket to, to see where I'm at. Uh, and I'm keeping the same hours that they are, so long hours. Uh, but I will be painting live, uh, doing Triple H versus Roman Reigns, uh, the championship main event. And I'll also have about, uh, 50 original paintings there that are framed and matted, and the mats are signed by the superstars and divas. Excellent, excellent. So something for everybody to look forward to, seeing you paint live, seeing those paintings available. And besides the live painting at the Superstore, where else will you be? That's going to be pretty much it. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm there open to close each day. So like Thursday, uh, working from noon to 11 p.m. Uh, Friday, uh, I think it's, you know, uh, uh, around those same hours, I think I get there a little earlier. Saturday, I'm pulling like a 14 hour shift and, and Sunday, uh, working from eight to one. And then, you know, just wrapping that up and going right on over to, to watch WrestleMania. I was going to say, I hope they don't have you peeing while the event's going on at the AT&T Center. That'd be kind of a bummer. That's a, it's a bummer to miss the NXT show, especially since I'll be in the same building, but. You know, when when you become part of the show, a lot of times you don't get to see the show. See, now that's one of the places that unfortunately will cross paths, but we won't have long to talk, because I'm going to the K. Bailey Hutchinson Center to see NXT TakeOver that night, and it's out of all the shows I'm going to this weekend, that's probably the one I'm looking forward to the most. Oh, it looks amazing, and, and it's going to be awesome to see Nakamura in a WWE ring going against Sami Zayn. I mean, that's two guys in their prime, and I don't know that the WWE universe as a whole is quite ready for how big a deal uh, Shinsuke Nakamura is going to be. No, I'm not sure they are, but New Japan fans are. The people that I do my podcast with are, because they've long time <laughs> been singing the praises of Shinsuke Nakamura, and I've long been singing the praises of El Generico before he ever came to WWE, so this is like everybody's dream indie match come true in a WWE ring. Oh, it's amazing. You know, like uh, last week on Raw, when uh, AJ Styles was going against Kevin Owens, it hit me. Like, this is the face of TNA versus the face of Ring of Honor in a WWE ring. And it's awesome. <laughs> although, although, to some respects, I would actually call AJ Styles a Ring of Honor original. It's just he wasn't there for very long before TNA scooped him up and he was there for a decade. Right. And in fact, that's kind of become a running joke now with can AJ Styles mention TNA or not? I noticed they made fun of that on the Edge and Christian show. Like, can he say where he's been for the last 10 years? And then they put up a graphic <laughs> with, with like the letters TNA pictures, but they couldn't actually say it. Yeah, they just had uh, Test and Albert up there with Chris Stratus. <laughs> <laughs> right. That was genius. That was a genius move on their part. <laughs> so, yeah, that, that takeover show is going to be fantastic. But you mentioned painting the Triple H versus Roman Reigns feud. And what do you think of that battle in general and uh, the reactions Roman Reigns has been getting leading up to this match? Well, you know, here's something that he, he's getting the John Cena reaction, right? Women and children are going crazy for him, and and uh, the dudes are are booing him. Um, but either way, the crowd cares, you know, and that can be worked with. And also, I think recently, uh, especially since, uh, well, leading into the Royal Rumble, and since then, you know, he might have been walking into boos, but by the time he left, the crowd was crazy for him. Um, and also I think a lot of the, you know, the internet community especially has forgotten 
how awesome the Shield versus Evolution feud was, mm-hmm. and and how epic those matches were. And I think that these two guys are going to deliver something on those lines. And I think, well, and also Triple H is never going to do anything but bring a minimum of 100% to a WrestleMania match. And even when it was a non-WrestleMania match, like at Roadblock, he went out there and had a fantastic match with Dean Ambrose. It takes two to tango. Oh, yeah. And they both tangoed big time. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, everyone, you know, talks quite a bit about how coachable Roman Reigns is. And and when he puts on his game face, you know, it, it's time to go. And like I've been backstage and, you know, pretty often and, and I was at a house show and everyone's gathered around the monitor watching the show and I'm watching Roman watching the show because like I started noticing that like his, his shoulder was twitching or he'd move his arm or he'd like, you know, make a facial expression and it hit me. He's watching this, putting himself into the match, what he would do if he were in there and, and also paying attention to what you know, everyone else is doing. And, and I think over time that's going to just continue to, to, you know, send him on on the rocket. Uh, you know, like Steve Austin talked quite a bit from when he was younger. Um, Dutch Mantel taught him that, you know, always sit there and watch the the rest of the show because you're going to learn something. Well, everybody seems to think that he is the future, and WWE certainly pushes him like he's the future, but it feels to me that because so many people anointed him the future, that's where your hardcore vocal fans started rejecting him. They they just said, hey, wait a minute, we're the fans, we should pick who the future is, not everybody else. And and I argue that that's people on the internet. Um, and Which is not where so we are right now. Are, so I mean, that's the right. <laughs> uh, but but not so much uh, putting down their hard-earned dollars because, um, like, I'm able to see a lot of the actual numbers. You know, like with my shirt sales that I have through WWE Shop, Roman Reigns is far and away my hottest seller. Uh, with my my Canvas to Canvas show, where I'm getting you know between 150 thousand and a quarter million views a week. My Roman Reigns one did 350,000. Uh, pe- while, while it's cool, kind of, to, to diss on him, uh, the actual numbers are showing a totally different story. The numbers don't lie, as they say. Yeah. <laughs> At least not to me. <laughs> no. And I think there is something to that idea of, it's cool to reject him now. It's like, it's the in thing to do. Like, for a while when fans chanted CM Punk at everybody, because it was just the cool thing to do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, or, you know, like, if you look at the internet, John Cena is the most hated wrestler of all time. But when you look at the numbers, he's still doing uh, about half of all merchandise sales, not even being there. You know, I made this argument to somebody in a UFC discussion the other day when they talked about how John Jones might be the most hated guy in UFC. And my response was, well, UFC doesn't mind that one bit. If he's the most hated guy in the company and he does over 850,000 buys on every pay-per-view he's on, they'll love him being hated. Oh, yeah. As long as people care, you know, you can still work with that. <laughs> Now, you talked about the statistics on the YouTube series, and if everybody's not watching those Canvas to Canvas videos, let me go out of the way to plug them right now. Go to YouTube, just search Canvas to Canvas, or go to WWE's channel and look for it. I get a new one every single week on my subscriber feed, and you talked about the numbers for the Roman Reigns one. What is the biggest numbers you've seen on any of them, bar none? The Roman one uh, is, is the most popular. Uh, and that was like really quick, you know, like, you know, numbers continue to accumulate over time. You know, people can still go watch the videos. Uh, the Roman one is, is heads and shoulders above all the others. Uh, and, and it was cool. Uh, I was backstage before, uh, that video went up. So we were able to get Roman doing a, uh, you know, quick little art critique on the painting, <laughs> which it was like right after a match and, and the, the, YouTube team grabbed him and they're like, hey, we need you to do a quick art critique of this painting. It's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, you know, that was all, all on the fly. Uh, but he's always been really cool to me. But, um, beyond that, uh, Brock Lesnar, uh, there was one of those that was very popular. 
uh, right around the time when uh, Kevin Owens destroyed that painting of mine. Uh, that that was a pretty popular video, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, sometimes when I have ones of the women, you know, like uh, especially the you know Charlotte and Sasha and Becky and Bailey. Uh, fans that are really gravitating to those as well. It seems like Owens is maybe the example of what we're talking about when it comes to the internet fan reaction, because like you said, he destroyed the painting, he's rude to people, he blocks fans on Twitter, and everybody eats it up. They can't get it up of the guy. Yeah, yeah. He, he's doing a great job at uh, being disliked in a way that still that he's still liked, you know. uh um and, and that he's, you know, very upfront and black and white about why he's doing what he's doing. It's really easy to, uh, to at least, you know, be entertained by that character. You know, he's kind of the, uh, the Walter White of WWE. <laughs> well, exactly. That, I, that's a beautiful example because he's the bad guy with good intentions. He believes everything he's doing is for his family and to provide for their future. And he can justify any nefarious thing he does for that reason. Right, yeah, it makes for really compelling television, without a doubt. It certainly makes him easy to watch, because it, a lot of characters are undefined or unclear, but his is so drawn, no pun on art or painting whatsoever, but it's just, you know exactly <laughs> who he is and what he stands for, and if you hate him, you've got a perfect good reason to hate him, and if you love him, and you believe he's right, and he's morally justified, you got a perfectly good reason to love him. A- absolutely. You know, that's the problem I have right now with Shane McMahon versus Undertaker. So I want to get your thoughts on that because I really can't figure out what I would want out of that match because if Undertaker wins, the authority retains control of Raw, which I don't really want. And if Shane wins, Undertaker retires, and I don't really want that either. As a fan, it leaves me very confused. Yeah, yeah, the, you know, the stakes are high on, on both ends. And, and can definitely create a, a type of reaction that people might not want. Um, I, I think what would be cool is if they find a way, even, you know, like during the match possibly to set it up so that both guys win. You know, what if the match changes? What if, you know, uh, something gets involved to where, uh, Vince or, or, uh, the rest of the authority have to change the match and like what if say like Shane and Taker end up on a team together uh you know what what happens with that um but there's a lot of ways and and there's absolutely no way that they're not going to throw all the bells and whistles at this match uh and you know like there's so many classic moments with Shane and of course Undertaker at WrestleMania at the very least, it's going to be interesting. Oh, I'm sure it is, but you're right. They, they're they going to need the bells and whistles, and they've pretty much built it up to the point where anything less than that, I think, would be disappointing when you're talking about the grandest stage of WrestleMania. But since we're talking about Shane, what about doing an individual portrait of him? Is that something that's in the works? Yeah, it's. Uh, I, I kind of don't know why I haven't yet. Um, but, but yes, uh, uh, definitely want to do something uh, of him you know for for the longest time you know he just hasn't been associated with the company uh so i was you know more putting my time towards the people that were on the, the current roster uh but yes i i definitely want to do something solo of him i've had him included in a few group shots but right like a family portrait I, be- I believe you had him in a, in a mcmahon family portrait if i'm not mistaken yes and the that that original painting is hanging up in Vince's private uh, conference room. That was Stephanie's Christmas present to him. Yeah, no pressure on that one, right? <laughs> no, not at all. But it's to say that you profiled Shane, you've, you've at least painted him before, but not individually by himself. Yeah. That would be something we'd all look forward to seeing on Canvas to Canvas. But how surprised were you when he came back anyway? Because as you referenced, he hadn't been associated with the company for many years, something like nine or ten years before he came back. Yeah, it was a huge surprise. Um, <laughs> we were having, uh, technical difficulties at home with our cable box. And, uh, you know, I was, I was, uh, on the line with tech support on that, getting taken care of and following, uh, Raw on Twitter. And I just turned to my wife, who's also a huge fan. And, and I say, Oh, Shane McMahon just walked out and she just lost her mind. <laughs> yeah, she's like, get this fixed right now. <laughs> 
every single fan I knew that I was talking to online that night, Facebook, Twitter, or wherever, all had the same reaction if they weren't watching it. They, they all said, you're making this up. I'm like, no, yeah. I'm definitely not making this up. Shane O'Mac is back. And then all of a sudden, you know, like, and he's facing The Undertaker at WrestleMania in a hell of a cell. <laughs> it's like, whoa, this just keeps like... It's like, you know, just cutting another uh, uh, layer into an onion, you know, like there's just more and more coming out. To be honest, I think that's actually become the hook for WrestleMania this year. I know Roman Reigns and Triple H has been a feud that's built up all the way since uh, last summer, but I think for the people who weren't invested in the idea of WrestleMania beforehand, the idea of Shane McMahon coming back to feud with The Undertaker for control of Raw has become that thing they can sink their teeth into. Yeah, it's definitely uh, a marquee match. Uh, also, uh, Lesnar against Ambrose. Um, I think that there's going to be a few moments from that that are going to be on the WrestleMania highlight reel for years to come. Yeah, well, especially with the anything goes build up they've had, you know, with Mick Foley giving him a barbed wire bat and Terry Funk giving him a chainsaw. It's like, you know, they they're they're basically setting up for how can they top this and the level of brutality that they're going to display in what's theoretically a PG environment, but in this match, they, but that may just go out the window. Right, and, you know, the, the PG is more towards the, the televised content. They can maybe push it a little more on, on uh, something that's on the network and pay-per-view. Uh, right. And also, though, the, the match that I think that could actually steal the show, like Steamboat Savage style, um, is is the triple threat for the Divas title. Uh, those three women have proven time and again that they can tear the house down. And and now they're in the biggest house possible, and they're going to do everything they can to make this maybe the biggest and most memorable women's match of WrestleMania history, but also maybe just one of the top playing matches in WrestleMania history. You know, I have this sneaking feeling, and I can't prove it, it's just a theory, but I feel the boss hit the canvas, and now she's going to hit the grandest stage and win the Divas title. Yeah, and and uh, boy, wouldn't this be just a cool moment, and and uh, I have no knowledge about this. It's, you know, <laughs> I, I try to stay as far away from any creative plans as possible. Every now and then, I'll come across one, and, and I just throw it right out my other ear. Uh, so this is just, you know, me making a, a, you know, out there assumption, but this would be a cool time to see the passing of the Divas title and the, the, the women's title making a comeback. Indeed. In fact, it would be very good timing for publicity purposes, considering that Snoop Dogg is going in the celebrity wing of the Hall of Fame and Sasha is a cousin of his. So, man, the publicity they could get. And WWE loves that kind of mainstream publicity. If they pulled that off in the same weekend, they would get lots of press. Oh, yeah. And what if, like, Snoop is involved in Sasha's entrance, right? You know, like, I don't know that they've ever had a big, epic uh, entrance for a, a women's match. And with these three, there's just so many possibilities you can have, you know, like, could this be the time that Charlotte comes out in a rope, right? Like, you know, how epic would that be? Or, or, uh, uh, you know, all the different steampunk things that you could do with Becky. There's just so many possibilities here. Now, out of all the women in this match, who's been your favorite to paint? Oh, that's tough. I'm, especially since I'm friends with all three. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, like, each of them have their own very distinct personalities uh, that, that push me in different kind of creative directions. Uh, with Charlotte, I try to show both her her toughness and her regal nature. Uh, and uh, uh, with Sasha, I just try to show the, the badassness of her, but also coupled with the beauty. And and with Becky, there's, again, all those steampunk elements where I can really push it visually. Um, a recent one I did of Sasha, uh, people have just really gone nuts for and really responded to. Uh, so, uh, but, you know, that that's currently the one that I, I like quite a bit. Although I've also heard from a lot of people that they're loving their Becky Lynch shirts uh, with my painting on it, too. I would say that's a good choice for a shirt. If you're going to go get one on WWE Shop, go get that one right now. But 
as long as we're referencing favorites, I would just say that recent video was one of my favorites, and the Lunatic Fringe hits the canvas. That was one of my favorites as well, going back to Dean. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That was a fun one, uh, you know, pushing a different kind of uh, design element with, with the circle in there. And, um, you know, Dean is always tough to paint. Uh, he has very distinct facial features that he does that are, uh, really hard to capture. And then his hair just drives me batty. Oh yeah. It's uh, all over the place. It's going in a million directions at once. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, Oh God, start shaving your head, dude. You know, save me a lot of time. <laughs> What's funny is he's had that his whole career because I was following him in the, in the days when he was John Moxley on the independent scene, and his look is virtually the same from then to now. Yeah, yeah. If something works, go with it. Um, but I wish he would cut his hair off. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's got to, just to compare the two guys in the match, it's got to be much, much easier to work with Brock Lesnar because that is a very square, muscular, defined person that you just look at it and go okay i can capture this no sweat yeah yeah uh to and that actually creates challenges of how do i push it further um and uh my last couple brock lesnar pieces uh i've started you know like really pushing it you know even a little bit further uh but yeah he's he he definitely uh is easier just just on the features than Ambrose, without a doubt. And yet there's something about him that every time I see him, I always think Midwest farm boy. And maybe it's because I'm from the Midwest and you're from the Midwest. Maybe we both have that sensibility. But there's just something about him that looks like he could be pitching bales of hay and he would just fit in as well as pitching people with a suplex. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, half my family are farmers, so <laughs> I've got some uh, corn-fed dudes that look pretty similar to him. And, <laughs> exactly. In my you grow up in the farming community, <laughs> you see people like that all the time. I know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, first time I met Brock was at Battleground last year, and uh, I was in the back painting, and I just kind of feel this this presence behind me. And I turn <laughs> around, and it's Brock, and he's pacing back and forth, getting ready for his match. And... Uh, it turned out he was, you know, interested in watching me paint. <laughs> and then, uh, the next day at Raw, um, I, uh, he, he was walking by with, with Paul Heyman and, and Paul and I have become friendly. So Paul stopped to talk. And like, I know Brock is not overly fond of human beings, but, uh, I, I went ahead and, you know, stuck my hand out and you know, said, hi, Brock. And, and, uh, you know, he shook my hand. He was, he was nice about it. Uh, and then they went along the way, but, you know, there's, there's what you expect when you meet Brock, and then there's the actual guy, and they're not too different. <laughs> no, he is an intimidating presence anywhere he goes. I, I think that's a given with Brock Lesnar, but at least that's something with, with your paintings, you can capture just how intimidating he is in real life. Yeah, yeah. Now, who would you say that had that Im- intimidating reputation that you thought, oh, my God, are they even going to want to be painted and turned out to be just the nicest person in the world about it? Randy Orton. Um, you know, he's he's got a reputation, right? Uh, and, and instead, he's been just incredibly warm and friendly to me every time we see each other. And, um, like, he'll go out of his way to stop and talk for a while. And, uh, he's just been, yeah, just really incredible. And then I'll see him being a little less so to other people, maybe. Um, so, you know, it's like, oh, he, he picked me to be someone to be friendly to. Uh, so that's cool. Uh, but yeah, he's, he's, you know, like even taller in person than, than I pictured him being. Like I'm six three and he's maybe got an inch or so on me. Um, and, and yeah, like, you know, he's got this presence about him and also like, like there's Randy Orton behind the scenes and then there's Randy Orton, the character, uh, but you can watch, uh, him like slowly, like transform into that character. And like when you, when when you can tell that that transformation is happening, you just kind of don't talk to him. (laughs) (laughs) Just just let him go into that zone. Yeah. It's it's Uh, like method. like, method acting almost it's like okay he's in the zone right now right it's exactly like that and then afterwards you know you give him a little time to decompress uh you know come back to being a human being (laughs) instead of (laughs) instead of a superstar 
<laughs> right. But I also get the feeling, just from watching Orton for so many years, that I feel like marriage and, and a family life has changed him. I think that's what caused him to soften around the edges a little bit and not feel like he has to just be this dickbag to everybody all the time. Yeah, yeah. You know, like, the big thing when whenever we sit down and talk is talking about uh, his daughter, you know, like, you know, what's going on in school and what she's into at the time. Um, yeah, it's definitely the home life has made a change with him. I wouldn't even say, not that Brock Lesnar is any less physically intimidating, but I think family has been good for him as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, but, but, you know, he still lives pretty remote, uh, away from everything, and, and that <laughs> works for him too. <laughs> I always wondered about that because to, to me, the, the person that he was marrying, Sable, was such a public figure that I wondered if she was really going to adapt to that rural, middle-of-nowhere kind of lifestyle. But it seems like she's done really well with it. Yeah. Yeah, I don't hear anything to the contrary. If it works, it works. I mean, it, it certainly wasn't the union I would have picked out on paper, like, who's Brock Lesnar going to end up with, who's Sable going to end up with. I did not picture those two, but they they definitely <laughs> hit it off. Yeah, if anyone... uh, uh bet on that one in Vegas. They, they got a good payday. <laughs> <laughs> hey, speaking of that, real quick segue. Uh, who did you pick in your March Madness bracket? Who'd you have going to the Final Four? Oh, I am a, uh, not involved with sports <laughs> at all. <laughs> Just sports I, uh, entertainment, not, not college sports. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and even though it, it happened pretty much just down the street from me here in Kansas City, uh, I, I, uh, uh, my, my wife stays up on things pretty good, but I grew up in a single mother household and she didn't like sports, so we didn't watch sports. <laughs> no, I totally understand. But like you said, with the Sprint Center playing host, you know, it was one of those things that very much on my mind, only being a few hours away, like if I wasn't so busy, I would have just taken the time and just gone and sat there for all those games because I love this time of year. It's like WrestleMania March Madness is like the best time of the year for me. <laughs> awesome. And yeah, like it, when, when that comes into Kansas City, it, it just transforms the whole town. And, and like, I've got a lot of friends that have local businesses and they tell me about, you know, what a uptick it is for them. And, and I'm sure, you know, like any host city for WrestleMania definitely sees that. Yeah, I just saw a report the other day that they expect $140 million in revenue in the Dallas Fort Worth area. Easy. Yeah, easy. Yeah, that's probably underselling it. It's just, you know, they got to start with a point somewhere, and then if they vastly exceed that, then they can crow, look, we did $300 million in business and be even happier. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just like that WrestleMania attendance. If they say, you know, 80,000 people are going to be there, they hit over 100,000, then they, they can say, biggest WrestleMania of all time, biggest event at AT&T Stadium of all time. Right, yeah. You know, you want to uh, manage expectations uh, for sure when you're, especially when you're throwing out numbers. And, and I think some people will object to the way WWE throws out numbers because, and I do think this will legitimately be the biggest attended WrestleMania of all time, but they've been known to to play a little funny math with those numbers in terms of people going through the turnstile as opposed to the number of people they say did. <laughs> I cannot speak on that one way or another. <laughs> all, all that I know is uh, the last couple of years when I've been there in person, it's been a ton of freaking people. The last time I went to one in Texas, it was at the Reliant in Houston, and that was a ton of freaking people. Yeah. I have no doubt they will pack the AT&T Stadium. So it's going to be a fantastic weekend. And, Rob, before I let you go, I want to get this chance to plug social media and, once again, all the things you'll be doing with the WWE live experience of seeing you paint while people shop for merchandise. Yeah, Thursday through Sunday, I'll be at uh, the K. Bailey Hutchinson uh, Convention Center right outside of Access in the Superstore. So it's free to the public where I'm set up. And I'll be painting live, and we'll have original art and uh, prints there as well. Also, uh, uh, watch each Sunday on WWE Canvas to Canvas on their YouTube channel. Uh, watch me uh, make my paintings. Uh, this coming weekend is one that's celebrating WrestleMania. Uh, this and one from just a few days ago was for NXT TakeOver. And, of course, you know, the week after, you'll be able to watch what I did at Access just in case you weren't able to make it to the show. And if you want my art, uh, you can go to www.shop.com. There's actually a section just for me in there. And also uh, robshamburger.com, my website. 
website, I have a lot of originals and limited edition uh, pieces there as well. And on uh, social media, it's at Rob Schamberger, R-O-B-S-C-H-A-M-B-E-R-G-E-R for both Twitter and Instagram. And it's Art of Rob Schamberger on Facebook. Excellent, Rob. As always, it's a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for the time. And I may be just uh, throwing something out there that doesn't work because I'll probably be one of a thousand people at the K. Bailey Hutchinson Center wearing this. But if you see a guy come up wearing a Kevin F. and Steen shirt who wants to shake your hand, it might just be me. <laughs> oh, and that reminds me, I keep forgetting to t- say this in interviews. Um, anyone that shows up wearing one of my shirts from shop, uh, I have an Ultimate Warrior print that I purposefully did not color in the face paint. Tell me what your two favorite colors are, and I'll hand color that in for you, and you'll get a one-of-a-kind print. Fantastic. So wear your shirts when you see Rob. Please wear them, and you'll get the chance <laughs> to get that limited edition one-of-a-kind canvas. But, Rob, again, thank you so much. Hope to see you this weekend. All right. See you there, man. Thank you.